Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Andy Black. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a senior engineer uh, at Medical Murray, just outside of Chicago. Uh, my background is biomedical engineering, and I've spent a little over eight years with Medical Murray, uh, primarily focused on design of uh, catheter-based products. Um, some information on Medical Murray. Uh, we provide uh, development and manufacturing services to a broad uh, customer base. We have two facilities, both located near Chicago, uh, solely dedicated to uh, medical device development and manufacturing. <clears throat> so what I plan to talk about today is uh, design optimization for catheters that uh, require accurate axial positioning. What I mean by that is uh, devices where there are components inside of the device that have to move relative to one another um, in order to achieve some desired function. Um, I'm sure if any of you have had experience designing catheters like this, you can probably relate to the statement I have on the screen. Um, as with early prototyping, I think we all know that uh, there are several challenges, several variables that uh, have to be considered um, to meet the product requirements uh, to achieve uh, the desired result. <clears throat> so a summary of uh, what I plan to discuss, I'll first go over some example applications of devices where accurate positioning is critical. Um, we'll go through some design considerations that should be evaluated uh, during product development. Um, I'll share some, some methods that, uh, that we use to optimize design and overcome the challenges. And I'll provide some insight into um, how we go about uh, combining the solutions to uh, decide the right combination of, uh, of methods to, to meet product needs. So shown here are some uh, examples of devices where uh, uh, axial positioning is critical. I think so. I think one of the uh, one of the areas currently that's most prevalent would be uh, implant deployment, such as stents and valves. Uh, these these sorts of devices may include a, a member within the device that has to push um, the implant um, out of a out of an outer sheath or outer covering. Um, another sort of device uh, would be. Uh, for sensor positioning in these applications, length can be critical where we need to advance a sensor a, a, a precise length from the tip of the catheter to, to an area in the blood vessel or in the surrounding tissue. And a third, third area would be actuation of baskets or expandable features. The uh, picture on the right here shows an expandable basket made from nitinol braid. So this device has a core wire through the center uh, that's attached to the tip of the catheter on the right side of the picture. And then it has an outer tube that's attached to the proximal end of the basket on the left side of the picture. So in order to expand the basket, the user holds the outer tube and then pulls the core wire, which compresses the basket or, and expands the, uh, expands the feature. So I think uh, no matter how complex these devices are, I think it helps to, uh, to simplify the, uh, the loads and the, uh, the challenges involved to three components. There's a member in tension, a member in compression, and then there's an interaction between those members. And then <clears throat> we have to consider uh, several uh, variables that are going to affect the, the loads that are applied as a result of, uh, of, of this action. So I think the first thing that probably comes to mind would be, uh, would be friction. And uh, it's probably one of the most important uh, factors that's going to decide whether the device works properly or not. So I like this picture because if you know me, you know that I love sports. And being from Chicago, I thought um, a picture of Derrick Rose would be, would be applicable here. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is uh, you can see the, uh, how much he's relying on the friction of, of the shoe to the floor to, uh, to drive to the basket. And a lot of times we use the same sorts of catheter materials um, is used in the sole of that shoe where we don't want friction and it actually inhibits the ability to have controlled or precise motion. Um, friction is going to create inertia or lag in the device that makes controlled movement especially difficult um, in procedures where visualization is needed. Um, if you're, if you're uh, relying on an x-ray image to, to position a component properly and there's a, a delay between your motion of your handle and, and the tip of your catheter um, it can be challenging to, uh, to have the right positioning. <clears throat> uh, friction is worsened by the environment. Blood getting into the lumens of the catheter um, will enhance the effects of friction. And obviously material selection then is critical to, uh, to minimize um, the effects of this, of this load. 
Second consideration would be anatomy. Um, if all blood vessels were straight, life would be easy, but I think we can see in the picture that they're not. So we have to uh, introduce flexibility into the device. Um, and with flexibility comes tackier plastics, tackier surfaces, more friction. Uh, we have to take tighter turns um, into smaller locations. So we have reduced wall thicknesses, um, lumens that want to go oval or kink as a result of this, and there's more surface contact for the interaction between components. Um, we also have to consider the length of the target location. As, as devices become longer, the magnitude of these loads uh, increases. A third consideration that I think is sometimes can be overlooked is the effects of moisture absorption in the, in the plastic or the effects of humidity on the length. Um, this consideration is critical for devices where we need to advance one component from the tip a specified length. And if these, are, if these components are of dissimilar materials, um, depending on the environment they're stored in, we can have a different result um, after, a, after a set period of time that it's exposed to, to a, a more or less humid environment. Uh, elastic deformation is another consideration. This kind of goes along with some of the loads that are applied um, as a result of friction and, and, and some of the other considerations I've discussed. You can see that um, under just moderate loads, uh, some of the common materials we use have uh, pretty significant changes in length. Um, and so these can be a result of, of friction in the device. It can also be to, to push an implant from the tip, the load um, just required to, to perform that function. And the last consideration I, I want to discuss is, uh, is residual stress. This happens when materials are converted from base resin into like an injection molded part or uh, an extrusion. These, the, the, uh, the component then will maintain a stress in it that will relieve itself over time. Um, oftentimes during the sterilization process, the, the stress is, uh, or the, the relief of that stress is accelerated because the device uh, sees elevated temperatures. If our sterilization process doesn't have elevated temperatures, then uh, the, the, the uh, components will continue to um, relieve that stress slowly over time, and that's when a, a shelf life study can become a learning experience as the device doesn't function as it did two years, two years prior, um, you know, when it was checked. Um, another, another thing to consider is for self-expanding components. There's implants that may use metallic components that are compressed and if they're packaged in, inside of a catheter tube or a plastic, plastic tube, um, they're, they're going to continue to apply stress inside of that tube and they're gonna, and they're gonna nest themselves sort of in that, in that tubing. So uh, you know, the loads that are evaluated early on um, to push that implant out or, or achieve the desired function may change pretty drastically over time as the, as the implant um, uh, nests itself into the tubing. <clears throat> So I've gone over several challenges uh, with accurate uh, axial positioning, so let's go over um, some methods we can use to optimize the design to overcome the challenges. I think the key, uh, obviously, is material selection, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, choosing the right materials gives us the baseline function that we can, that we can evaluate loads and, and decide um, further what further solutions are needed. Um, if we decide the, the uh, considerations such as anatomy and friction and so on, uh, if the loads are too great that, that the, uh, the base components uh, can't perform the, the desired function, then we start adding mechanical reinforcement. Uh, some common methods that we use could be closed coils, um, shown in the upper right. Um, these are excellent for, for uh, pushability, or they resist compression. Um, another advantage for thin wall devices is that they'll maintain, maintain roundness uh, in the catheter. And, and minimize the effects of friction or uh, minimize the, the interaction between the, uh, the moving components. Uh, for, for elongation, we, we can use axial filaments um, along the length of the catheter to resist, to resist tension. Um, these could be stainless steel wires, nitinol wires. Uh, we can also use fibers. Um, and they're typically embedded into the wall. Um, and, and they'll, they'll, they do a nice job of uh, resisting elongation. 
One consideration with those is that they are, are going to uh, add stiffness and lateral bending. So the plane that those are um, installed in the catheter shaft, it's, it's going to, to limit the, the amount of flexibility the, the shaft has. Uh, one way to get around that is, uh, is cut hypotubing. Um, this is a method we can use um, that virtually has an endless number of, of patterns that could be designed and cut out of tubing. Um, and this allows for uh, you know, a design of a shaft that could resist compression uh, and tension in the same shaft and maintain uh, a uniform lateral flexibility. Um, I think the down, downside with this sort of design is, is cost, especially if we have a longer, longer catheter that may require this component over the full length. <clears throat> Another method for mechanical reinforcement is braid. Um, I think braid's commonly used for torqueability within catheters, but uh, in devices where you have moving components relative to one another, we also need to think about how we can design the braid pattern so that we can resist compression and, and elongation uh, in the device. Um, braid is a nice way to hold down uh, or to hold axial filaments in place that I that I just mentioned. It makes that process repeatable, makes makes the fill or can hold the filaments straight along the uh, the catheter shaft. Um, so we can use a combination of methods such as such as braid and axial fibers to achieve uh, compression and tensile resistance. Uh, I think coatings and lubrication are, are kind of a game changer with materials um, when we're when we look at. Uh, applications where high flexibility is needed. Um, we can implement coatings to, to reduce the loads that are required um, and, and, and reduce the amount of reinforcement we need to, to move components. Um, there's a number of different coatings that can be used. Hydrophilic, fluoropolymer such as PTFE can be applied. Um, we can also use um, lubricants like silicone oil to, uh, to facilitate motion between the components. So I mentioned uh, <clears throat> the effects of humidity on the length of the length of components and the effects of residual stress. Um, there's methods we can use to to overcome those um, and maintain dimensional stability. Uh, oftentimes we can we can use a heating or baking method on on components to uh, to relieve the stress that may be may uh, reside in, in the catheter shaft. Uh, when we, uh, when we uh, you know, process the device, we uh, often want to think about the uh, environment the device is going to be used in. So I had mentioned the uh, humidity effects. It, it usually takes several hours for um, you know, a, a high moisture content environment to, to significantly affect the length of a device. So typically we want to think about the storage environment and, and we want to, uh, we want to, to uh, process the catheter and you know, choose the lengths of the catheter in, in an environment that will be similar to the storage environment. And then we can use, utilize materials that have low water absorption uh, for lengths of the device that, that don't require as much flexibility. So a hypo tube could be used for the proximal end of the device. Um, so this slide I kind of consider the cheating slide. If, we, you, if, if space permits in the device, we can kind of bypass all of the, uh, all of the factors involved with friction and, and uh, changing in length due to, to stresses and so on by, by using electronics at the tip of the catheter to facilitate the motion we need. Um, there's motion actuators available that are you know, under, under two millimeters in size that, could be, that can be installed in the distal tip of a device. And then all of the motion that we're, that we're uh, using to, to facilitate the action is, is relative to the tip instead of, instead of the handle. And we don't have all the stack up um, from all the variables. Uh, these, these sorts of actuators can, can be used to apply a specific load at the tip um, or create motion to advance uh, a component of specified distance. So we have several ways to, uh, to overcome the challenges um, to achieve uh, a accurate positioning um, of, a, of a device. And so how do we go about deciding the right solution and, and combining those solutions um, into something that works. I think care and time should be put into uh, to specifying the challenges and defining the requirements. Um, this allows us to you know, define the amount of reinforcement we need and the loads that are gonna be, that are gonna be applied within the device. Um, so then we can, we can start to uh, put together a combination of materials, coatings, and reinforcement that's gonna best meet the requirements. Uh, I think it should be 
should be a given that uh, you know we're oftentimes multiple iterations are going to be needed to achieve the result. We may find that we need more reinforcement. We may find that that uh, due to the the coatings that we're able to to apply, that uh, you know we can reduce the amount of reinforcement uh, needed in a device. And then we always have to test the device in as close to actual use conditions as possible. And this is where an animal study can be can be a, a very valuable tool. Um, so that we don't overlook uh, challenges that can be associated with function of the device. So why is the handle moving but not the tip? Um, I think we've, we've outlined the challenges involved and, and why, it, why it can be uh, challenging to, uh, to design a catheter that's going to function in this manner. Um, there's numerous methods we can use to overcome those challenges, which I've outlined here. And Again, I think care and uh, defining the, the initial requirements um, will lead to the optimal combination of those, of those solutions uh, to meet the product needs. Uh, thanks for your time. I hope uh, if, if any of you have any uh, questions, please feel free to stop by our booth, um, and we'd be happy to discuss your application.